So uh, what I figured I would do is just go through and, and basically talk about some of the some of the things that we have with DeLorean Parts Northwest and and uh, some of the things we're doing in the shop and uh, just uh, kind of make everybody aware of, of it if they haven't been before and um, uh, and see if there's any questions. Uh, so anyway, the. Uh, I'm not really a pro at PowerPoint here. <clears throat> so the first thing to talk about is the uh, the Wings Aloft remote door opening systems. And there's there's a bit of confusion out there because we have so many choices. <laughs> um, but uh, but essentially it goes from a, a basic system that uh, that has the capability of remotely opening both doors and uh, and and a couple of other features. And then, uh, but but doesn't incorporate any kind of alarm system. <clears throat> and that, or currently, we have a, a, a basic and then an extended basic. Uh, one has five channels; the other one has eight. <clears throat> and then, um, and then we step up from there, uh, and um, and then there's the deluxe. The deluxe system incorporates an alarm system as well as the remote door opening and remote lock and unlock. Uh, and, uh, and then there's also a, an expanded version of that, which has two-way remotes. And then uh, stepping up from the deluxe is the elite, uh, which incorporates remote start. So you got lots of uh, a range of, of options that are available there uh, for uh, anything that you want to do as far as the wings aloft go. And then there's a bunch of um, uh, standalone things, such as the remote door lock actuator upgrade. And then there's uh, accessories like the remote trunk release and uh, the, the door open or the, uh, window controls that have been mentioned on, on a video before. Uh, so anyway, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things that are involved in the Wings Aloft line. Uh, and uh, people just need to uh, kind of understand what their end goal is, uh, you know, how many features they want, do they want an alarm or not, and, uh, and then just figure out which which product uh, best fits their end goals. So hopefully that's clear. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about were these uh, engine dress up covers. Um, uh, they, they were uh, introduced a couple of years ago and then we, we had a, uh, a little bit of a supply problem, finally tracked down a new, distrib or a new manufacturer. And uh, anyway, so they're available again now and uh, have been for a little bit. Uh, so we've got three different things. There's the throttle spool cover, which can be uh, uh, installed plain, or you can install it uh, after having it etched. And there's uh, uh, one etching that works out pretty well, and that's the DMC logo uh, as shown in this picture. And then there's the throttle body cover, which uh, incorporates uh, two brackets on the uh, airflow mixture unit to mount it. And uh, it hides all the clutter of the throttle body. And that can also be etched with either a DMC logo or the stage one or two, uh, depending on if you've got you know, one of those options already incorporated in your engine. <clears throat> and those are, uh, those are etched to order. Uh, all these things that are etched are etched to order. I've got st uh, fixed stencils that I use to create the markings. So it's not really customizable necessarily. And then the uh, forward loom cover, it just covers up all the clutter on the forward firewall. Um, and that mounts to the original uh, rib nut locations where the engine stay used to be. And so the engine stay basically gets eliminated. Um, and so you have to go to a different option there. And that's either um, one of the existing uh, engine cover hanging solutions. Like we've got our, our little clips. Um, there's a, a center rib that's been for sale for a long time that has a, a little hanging feature uh, engraved into it. So there's a lot of different options that are available for hanging the lower engine cover. Uh, and, and what you wind up with is a nice clean looking uh, forward firewall where, where everything's kind of hidden away. 
so hopefully that's clear. The, um, for the engine cover, uh, the struts have to be long enough to be able to allow that. A lot of the uh, existing uh, louver struts are too short by about an inch. And so the louver doesn't open up far enough to be able to hang the lower cover from it. So um, then the next thing that, um, that we have is the third brake lights. Um, so the third brake lights, you know, it's a safety uh, addition that uh, is, I think, pretty much universally required on all cars now that are, that are manufactured. And uh, so it's, it's well documented that it enhances safety. Uh, the ones that we have, they're, um, they're weatherproof. Uh, we typically have them mounted underneath the upper slat of the louver, and then the wiring can go to either side and go down. Uh, the instructions tell you how to route the wiring down to, uh, to link up with one of the wires down on, on either the right or left hand taillights. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a really nice addition. Uh, they're completely hidden away uh, when they're not illuminated. They're, they're very subtle. Uh, but when you, uh, you know, touch the brake pedal and, and light up the brake lights, you obviously, you know, as you see in the picture, they're quite bright and, um, and they don't impede the rear vision at all from, uh, uh, you know, looking in the rearview mirror, you don't see these at all. So they don't impede the vision uh, whatsoever. <clears throat> um, and at the end of all this, you know, if anybody's got any questions on any of these things, uh, you know, feel free to ask. Uh, the net, next thing that we have is the LED headlight upgrade kit. Um, the, uh, as many people have mentioned, the, uh, the stock headlights in a DeLorean are horrible. They're, uh, uh, somebody said at one point they were like a flickering candle in the wind. Um, and so uh, there's been a lot of, of studies done over, over the years. You know, different people have tried uh, HID lights and uh, they're uh, up until recently, a lot of the different solutions were pretty hard to come by. Uh, we decided to go LEDs because that's, you know, the way the world is going and a lot less uh, current requirement as far as electricity goes. Uh, anyway, so these, uh, what we do is we use a, a high grade Hella housing from Germany. And uh, so they're, they're a very high grade housing, uh, good glass lenses with proper Fresneling and then uh, LED uh, light capsules. And we incorporate the, the H4 style on the outboards and then H1 style on the inboards so that you have the proper format, if you will, um, for the car. And they're 6,000 K coloration right now. Uh, we did have them a little bit warmer. They were down at about 5,000 K, but uh, all the manufacturers have gone to six as kind of like the, the industry standard. And it's really difficult to find any that are uh, a slightly warmer light, but these are uh, considered to be pure white. And um, so anyway, they're, uh, they're, uh, I've got them on my car and, and we've, we've had them on quite a few other cars, uh, obviously. And, and uh, it's universally uh, accepted to be a, a really nice upgrade if you're driving at night and, um, and you wanna be able to actually see where you're going, <laughs> so. Um, anyway, and then um, the next thing up would be the front sway bar bushings that we have. <clears throat> the original sway bar bushings, uh, there's, there's the, the donut bushings and then the mounting bushings. Uh, the mounting bushings are what connect the sway bar to the, uh, to the frame. And then the, the donut bushings connect the sway bar to the lower control arms. And um, the way the the okay so brent ryan I'm, I'm not sure if i'm supposed to answer your question now or wait but uh, anyway <laughs> no 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 wait wait until the end sir i just am getting in line all righty so the uh the front sway bar uh it does double duty as you mostly know uh as both a sway bar and also to locate the lower control arms in the front and in the case where you have um heavy braking um those donut bushings take up virtually all of the braking loads. And if they're starting to disintegrate the originals, uh, then your braking performance is gonna be greatly reduced and you're gonna have a lot of uh, directional problems under heavy braking. <clears throat> and so these, uh, these polyurethane bushings, I, I hand make these basically uh, from materials that I get. And then um, 
Uh, they've got stainless steel inserts on the donut bushings. Uh, everything fits in there very nice and it creates quite a bit of, of uh, added stability to the front uh, suspension, uh, especially under heavy braking or uh, aggressive driving. But uh, these, these have been uh, uh, on cars. We've, been, we've had these for sale um, since 2004 and they're on hundreds of cars throughout the world. And uh, they're generally accepted to be a, a really nice upgrade from a handling perspective. Um, just every once in a while, you just spritz them with uh, with some WD-40 or um, any kind of Teflon spray lube or anything like that. Um, they do have integrated lubricity, so there's graphite impregnated into the to the polyurethane. So they are self-lubricating, but uh, it's nice to maintain them every once in a while. <clears throat> um, next up is the um, the Batlef, a lot of people call it. This is the front shock tower brace. And uh, this links the, uh, the tops of the front shock towers on the frame uh, so that you get a, a load path across from one side to the other. Uh, I did some free body diagrams for, uh, there's a, another version that's a straight across rod. And the guy that had done that uh, asked me to do some stress analysis for him uh, when he was designing his product. And uh, in that in that analysis, I found that um, with lowered cars, uh, you can have up to between six and 900 pounds of side load on the shock towers uh, during heavy maneuvering. And uh, there's really nothing in the structure of the car to react to that load. And so the frame just kind of uh, deflects around as it sees fit. And uh, there's really nothing to help it out. So uh, something like this, uh, helps to create a boxed uh, structure in the front so that both sides can assist each other during heavy maneuvering. <clears throat> and the design of this particular uh, front strut brace allows for removal of the, of the spare tire if you should ever need it. And uh, you can also actually get to the fuel tank area through the access door. And you can also service your brake master cylinder without removing the bar at all. Uh, it does come with a little tensioner so that you can create a little bit of pretension uh, to make it uh, work all the time. Okay, so uh, that's that. And everything is made of stainless steel, so uh, it, it continues to look nice forever. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here is um, a next thing, which is the uh, oil drain valve. Uh, and this is a slide from uh, one of um, DeLorean Tech's. Um, videos showing it all uh, up in place and installed. There's uh, there's a pretty tight tolerance or clearance between the between the end of the drain valve and the frame, uh, so you usually have to use some kind of a, a piece of cardboard or or some kind of a way of deflecting the oil down so it doesn't get onto the frame. But the uh, the nice thing about these drain valves is uh, once installed, um, you don't have to mess with um, uh, special tools for your drain plug and um, always changing your crush washer to prevent seeping and leaking and um, the, the worry of stripped oil uh, pan threads and that kind of thing. Uh, so you just, in order to change your oil, you just uh, flip this lever. Uh, it allows the oil to drain out. You close the lever and, and uh, carry on. And so it becomes a lot more um, convenient to do your own oil changes. Uh, this particular product was uh, was was forced on on we, we put this out for Oliver Oliver and Terry Holler. They had had so many oil changes going on that uh, it was starting to worry them a bit. Uh, okay. Life of their oil pans. Who else is watching? And then um, the next thing up is the uh, the fans, the radiator fans, and um, so these are a straight blade fan that fit into the original shroud. Uh, that's the, the way they're designed. And that adapter ring, they're now silver. We've, we're having them made out of aluminum now to, to cut down on the weight a little bit. And, um, and so it, the, the kit comes with both fans and then the adapter rings and all the hardware that's necessary to mount them into the shroud. And then you'll see uh, on the wiring, uh, the pins are crimped on, but the connector shells are not there. Uh, we give the option of selling them with connector shells, but uh, those are becoming... Uh, harder and harder to, to come by and more expensive. So in order to save resources and save people money, 
um, what we're recommending they do is remove the, the connector shells from their old fans and just transfer them onto the new wires and then plug them right in. And, and the, uh, the uh, instructions explain how to do that. Uh, these fans move air very nicely. They draw about seven and a half amps uh, each. So quite a bit less than the originals for sure. Uh, they have a higher pitched uh, whooshing sound to them compared to the originals. Uh, but uh, anyway, they're, uh, they're serving uh, a lot of people all over the world very well. So uh, we're, we're really happy with, with how those are going. And um, they, uh, we just got a new batch in, so they're uh, available. Uh, the next thing up, which was discussed earlier, is the uh, adjustable fan switch. We were talking about it, I guess, in the, in the breakout room. Uh, so the adjustable fan switch, what this does is replaces the otter stat, and this makes, uh, makes it uh, possible for you to select the temperature that your radiator fans turn on at. And the range is from 160 all the way up to about 240. That's the range that's presented um, in the module right now. So uh, you can install these, the, the little silver uh, probe up at the top, that gets inserted into one of the, the coolant pipes. And, um, and then it, it's, it's provided with new clamps and, and everything you need to install. And uh, once it's installed, uh, it completely replaces the function of the otter stat, the original otter stat, but the original otter stat is left in place uh, as a way of plugging that hole. Um, so anyway, this, uh, this is a, a really nice addition. Uh, to, to allow for uh, lower fan turn on temperatures in the event that you're in a uh, parade at, you know, on a hot day or whatever have you. Just whenever you, you want to turn on the fans earlier, you can just with a twist of a knob. Um, and then the last slide I have up is uh, our remote battery cutoff switch. And so uh, there's a lot of different uh, solutions out there, big, big knobs that you turn to uh, to turn off power to the car, uh, all kinds of different ways of, of accomplishing that. In this particular case, we've got a, 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 a latching style solenoid switch that uh, can be activated either through one of the wings aloft systems. Uh, you can use your uh, remote key fob to turn your power on and off if you'd like, uh, or we can uh, get it set up with a, a uh, momentary toggle switch which allows you to turn the power on and off uh, very easily. The toggle switch can be hidden anywhere. And uh, none of this is visible uh, when installed in the car. So it's, it's uh, a little bit of a theft deterrent as well. And just very convenient for shutting power off and, uh, and turning it back on. So um, those are uh, available as well. And uh, anyway, so that's uh, some of the products that I wanted to talk about um, today. Uh, of course, we've we've just recently released the uh, sequential tail lights, and there's a number of people that have those, uh, and I think they're they're uh, being reviewed in in some videos. So anyway, those are uh, those are available, and um, uh, they're uh, yeah they're they're working out well. I've got them in my car. Uh, I've got one of the beta test prototypes in my car, and um, and everybody really likes the look of them. They're very bright. And they throw a lot of light out the back, which is uh, what I'm all about is safety. So anyway, uh, that's what I have to share. And so if anybody has any questions, uh, fire away. Let me see if I can figure out how to screen share myself here. Yeah, well, my first question for you, Toby, is I, we, I got about halfway through your presentation before I realized I should have been taking notes. Um, so would you be willing to share this what you can do is you can save this as a PDF from PowerPoint. Sure. And then if you want to mail that PDF to me and then anybody who wants to either email you or me, we can get this out to people because this is a terrific way to, for me to use as a reference to, to figure out what my next order uh, is going to be. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so definitely get me a PDF on that. And then uh, my question is about the headlights. I've seen lots of different people say, I have these head LED headlights and I have these LED headlights. Have you uh -huh. done any comparison of yours versus some of the other options out there? Can we say anything about why this is better than some of the other solutions? Um, well, the, um, what I was going for is, um, is, is a headlight that I could stand by, that I could stand behind. Um, they're, 
they're not really super, you know, cheap LEDs that uh, that are going to go out, you know, very very soon. You know, obviously there's going to be a, a an occasional problem with an LED. Uh, that's just the nature of that particular beast. Um, I haven't really done a lot of, uh, of side by side comparisons of different brands. Uh, we just I just looked through and and uh, started looking at at the background of different manufacturers and different features and uh, looked at their online reputation and then uh, and then settled on the ones that we're using now. Uh, the housings, um, what I like about the, the Hella housings, they're, they're made in Germany and um, they're very high quality and they fit perfectly. Uh, you don't have to have any uh, little spacers or anything like that to make them fit um, in the car. And some of the uh, less expensive versions, the octane lighting and and some of the others, um, they they're they're a very loose fit, and you have to create some kind of um, spacer to get them to to snug up behind the bezels. And so these, that's not the case. And they're uh, they're they're e code rated, so they've got a really nice uh, uptick on the right hand side, so that you can watch for the deer in the ditch kind of a thing. Now, it looks like there was a question in the chat from Nathan Gill. Would you like to unmute yourself, uh, Nathan, and ask uh, Toby directly? Nathan may not be uh, ready to do that. We'll give him another second. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but his, his question was, uh, is there a way with the adjustable fan switch to wire in the original Otterstat as a backup? So you could have the new switch set lower and the original could be the higher just in case. Is that recommended or required? It is not, it's neither recommended nor required, but it's also very possible to do if you'd like. <laughs> so does that make sense? Fascinating. Okay. Um, any other questions? Otherwise, we do have some housekeeping details to get. Oh, we have lots of questions. All right. Well, um, tell you what, just hold on just two seconds, Toby. Um, what we're going to do is there are some people that have not seen Jordan's film. And in about an hour and 30 minutes, Jordan will be hosting a Q&A about his film. So we had somewhat allocated this time for watching Jordan's film if you haven't seen it. So I will go ahead and post the links to that in the chat. But this is really important stuff and I would like us to continue uh, and get all the questions answered with Toby. So Toby, why don't you go ahead and, and answer a few more questions and I will post links in the chat to Jordan's film um, in case anybody wants that now. So go ahead, Toby. Brian, uh, Ryan, do you want to send the people to a uh, chat room to ask Toby questions? Do you Actually, we, we really have nothing left here that we can do. We cannot watch the video on this Zoom, according to Jordan. Anyone who would like to watch the video would have to go to the link that Ryan is choosing. So that means that what we have now, this particular Zoom uh, meeting, we can do whatever we want. So if we want to just continue on with Toby, we can do that. Does that sound good? And then we come back with the discussion with Jordan afterwards. I, I believe Ryan will- No, okay. So he, here's the deal. Um, basically for the next, um, for the rest, almost the rest of the evening, uh, we're kind of um, doing things the way Jordan wants. So the first thing is he wants his video to be seen in the absolute best quality possible, which I totally understand. And as a result, the only way to see his film is in the links I have just entered in the chat room. So you will click on the Vimeo link, it will open a new web browser, then it will ask you for a password and you enter the, the password, which is the DeLorean weekend there with some threes and zeros and a few things. Um, and then that will allow you to watch the film. The film is about 90 minutes long and that will take us right up to about seven o'clock. Um, also in the chat here, I will post the link to the what he calls the interactive Q&A live stream. And that will not be on this Zoom channel either. That will be at a YouTube live link and that will start at 7 p.m. Central time. So uh, check your local listings as needed for that. Um, 
So we basically have about 90 minutes before the, the live Q&A starts and his movie's 90 minutes long. So if you haven't seen his film, this would be a good time to click the Vimeo link, enter the password and watch his film. So that film will end with just enough time for you to jump on the YouTube live link provided below. But we know that not everybody wants to do that and we want to uh, keep going with Toby as, as uh, what we're gonna do on this channel. But once we conclude that in the next 10, 15 minutes, then we will kind of be um, just pe putting people in breakout rooms here or whatever. We're not gonna kick people out of this room by any means, but, but we are recommending that you instead jump over to the Vimeo links and then to the YouTube live. And then when that is done, there are a number of options. You could come back to this room or there are some other things we can do later this evening. But that's the, that's the plan and the schedule. So um, hop into Vimeo and then in an hour and a half hop into YouTube. Otherwise, let's keep going with Toby because there's questions. Does anybody else have a question regarding the agenda for the rest of tonight? Just so we make sure that's, that it's clear. If, if you do, unmute yourself and, and ask it right now. Okay, great. Then if not, we will continue. I think uh, Richard Federico has a question for Toby. I've got a question from the front end and from the back end. Uh oh, okay. On your headlights up in front, you go ahead and replace those two headlights, or actually the four headlights. Are you also going to go with LED lights in the running lights? Is that part of your kit? It's not part of the kit, but uh, you know that's certainly something that can be done. There's a lot of different uh, 1157 style of LED bulbs that are available out there. And it in, just your, in your picture, the, the running lights are lit up. That's why I was wondering whether they were part of the kit or not. Your, your headlights you're on the outside are lit up and then your two front lights are lit up on the bottom. Yeah, the yellow lights on the bottom. Right, those are, well, the, the running lights are gonna be uh, on when you have your headlights turned on. I guess I don't know if I understand your question. When I buy the kit for the headlights, mm -hmm. does it come with LEDs for those bottom yellow lights? No. No, okay. the, what the kit comes with is the is the four headlight housings, uh, both H4s for the uh, for the outside ones and then H1s for the inside ones. And then the uh, the LED bulbs, everything's pre-assembled. Uh, so you just have to, uh, to mount the headlights and, and the only thing that's necessary on the car is to reconfigure the connectors for the low beam positions. Uh, the DeLorean, the way that the DeLorean was wired originally, uh, it works well for the incandescent lights that came with the car, but they're not uh, wired to the international H4 standard. And so you just have to swap a couple of terminals in the connector uh, to bring the car up to H4 international standard. And then, uh, and then you can just plug the the LED pigtail in and you're done. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not quite plug and play, but pretty darn close. Okay, and, so I'm on my own to go ahead and get the LEDs to replace the two running lights. Yeah, and those, uh, there's a, like I said, there's, there's hundreds of different companies out there that are mm -hmm. making 1157 style LED uh, lights. No worries. Last question for the back, for the tail light, the mm -hmm. third brake light. Yeah. Do I have to drill through the louvers in order to mount it? How is yep. it mounted louvers? They are mounted with uh, 3M double-sided tape. No drilling required. No drilling required anywhere, no. Okay, that's all I needed. Thank you. You bet. Toby, Roland Hoffman. Hello, Roland. Hello, Toby. Question, in regarding with the uh, battery kill relay uh, kit, What's uh -huh. the recommended place to place the relay and the switch? Uh, what I recommend is to put the, uh, the relay right in the battery compartment, right alongside the battery. And so it comes with a couple of mounting screws uh, and, and it's got its own little bracket already. And uh, so you just uh, pop a couple of screws in there. So you're mounting the, the, the battery cutoff switch in the battery compartment tray, uh, itself. And, uh, and we supply a, a short battery cable uh, that then goes from the, from the new cutoff switch to the battery positive terminal. And then, uh, and then your original 
battery cable that used to go to the positive terminal of the battery now attaches to the switch. And then the, uh, the little, if you're gonna use the manual control of the battery cutoff switch with the, with the toggle, uh, that toggle switch, you can, you can hide it anywhere. I just installed one not too long ago uh, inside somebody's glove box. And so they can just flip open the glove box, uh, you know, click the, click the switch and turn off their battery power that way. Uh, it can be hidden anywhere you want, or you can have it hiding in plain sight. It's your choice. Very good. Thank you. Hey, Toby, it's Brandon. Yeah, Brandon. How's it going? Good. Me, visually. Um, your headlight uh, kit, is there any version of just buying the buckets from you, like a set of four instead of the entire LED array? Uh, so just the housings? Just the housings, yeah, the four halogen housings. Yeah, I imagine we can do that. Okay, I'll send you, a, I'll, I'll send you an email or call you sometime this week. Okay. Thanks. It would obviously be less than the uh, the cost of the LED kit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm already wired up for LED across the car, but I like the fact that you're saying that the buckets, um, the the housings fit flush because I do have a spacer situation that I want to kind of remove. Okay. So that would make it a lot cleaner of an install. So thanks. Are there any other questions for Toby at this time? Not a question offhand, but a comment. Uh, Toby, I, about 10 years ago, I bought your fans and your Autostat replacement. They have been working super ever since then. I just wanted to thank you for that. And kind of nice to actually see you to talk to you because it's been about 10 years and it was on a telephone. Nice. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> That's what's so great about Zoom is so many people have said, yeah, I've, I've texted this person or I've talked to him in a chat or whatever, Facebook, whatever, and, and they never got to, to equate a name and the face. So this is, this is a great way to do that. Thank you so much, Toby. Any other last chance? Pick his brain. <laughs> hey, Toby, how you doing? <laughs> Oliver. Hey, I just wanted to uh, mention, I've I use a lot of your products in our uh, DeLorean and they're all awesome. Uh, in addition to a link to your, your slideshow, I'd recommend just simply posting a link to your, uh, your online store because it'll have a lot more detailed information uh, about every one of the products that you've uh, shown, right? Sure. Okay. I can do that. And uh, yeah, as, as an aside for Oliver, um, he, uh, we, we set him up with a set of the LED headlights a few years ago and I told him that uh, at that time that uh, because they produce so little heat uh, when he's driving across the wilds of Wyoming in the middle of winter like he's often doing uh, he's not going to have his uh, his headlights automatically cleaning themselves off of ice and sure enough <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> it's a, a rare problem I will say that uh, I was using them during the daytime and I went for an extended lunch uh, lunch meeting. Uh, it was probably, I don't know, a couple of hours. And I came back to the parking lot and I saw that my headlights were on really bright and I thought, oh no, my battery's dead. And then I realized, <laughs> no, they're not because they're LEDs and they're still shining. So that was a great benefit. The car battery would have been dead for sure had they not been LEDs. Well, side benefit. Good. Okay. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Hey, Toby. It's Chris. Yep. Um, I just had a, I had a note for you on those uh, connectors for the fans, the, uh, the two wire connectors. Yeah. It seems that Ed Uding has had them remade and they're like $2 each or something. So if you, okay. I'd buy them from him if you need a new supply. Yeah, um, Ed's been doing a good job of kind of figuring out what needs to be reproduced and uh, he's getting after the program a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, the 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 two wire and the and the and the, the two pin and the three pin uh, are they they were starting to get a little bit hard to come by uh, unless you were willing to pay you know good money for them, <clears throat> and then um, and then so the you know those those supplies have been freeing up a little bit. Uh, we're still in a little bit of trouble on the nine pin connectors, uh, but uh, hopefully those will become more available as well. 
wonder if uh, 3D printing would be helpful with something like that. I'm assuming Brandon could probably make them for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you if you had one that I could look at, I could probably reverse engineer it and get you the file in a couple of days. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really uh, totally boned up on on 3D printing and stuff, but uh, it's a it's yeah, a pretty, pretty high tolerance uh, deal, you know. Because I can the, get I can get down to a tenth of a millimeter in accuracy. No, well, that'll probably so, do it. Yeah, I mean, to the point where like like these these keys are. Um, pretty precise and I can actually do things thinner than a strand of hair. Okay. So just engineering, it's more just about finding the, I just need the dimensions to actually recreate it. Got it. Brandon, EU City of the 3D printer, how many models of parts do you have already put together? Um, I've recreated files for the community and given them away for free, uh, but I've recreated a couple parts that don't exist anymore, like the louver cover caps that go over the back of the, uh, the louvers. I've recreated the uh, wiper blade uh, plastic clip that holds your uh, your wiper blade hose to your right passenger side wiper blade. And then uh, things like, you know, I did recreated the driver's key from the older DeLoreans, the lighted key, you know, so it kind of lights up. Let's see if I can have one that has a battery in it. There you go. And then um, quite a few other things. I mean, the last thing I've been 3D printing in steel recently. So like I have this this kind of like dongle that I use to hold my key in. It's just solid um, steel that's nickel plated and then anodized black. So it's it's interesting because I don't know. Chris Miles has been kind of giving me a lot of projects to do, so I've been designing a lot of things that either don't exist on the car anymore. Yeah, Chris is actually holding up the uh, louver caps I printed. I gave him a set for his car. So uh, these are kind of like weird unobtainium things that no one really knows to look for, and and I didn't have them on my car and. Brandon was over a tech day one day and said, hey, print these. And he said, oh, and then he got all excited and took out his rig and scanned them all. And, and he printed them out. They, they fit better than the originals. And- um, They're talking about 3D printing. You know, it's not something that's like important, but if you just want to have, have a part that you don't have or, you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's like, I, I can normally re either reverse engineer something that originally existed in a couple of days, or I can create something completely new. Like for those, I, I changed the tolerances because the originals were just plastic that were held on with adhesive tape. So they actually are now held on with friction because um, I still had the originals on mine. So typically it's like, I kind of vet things, like I'm probably going to rebuild the taillight housings uh, into a more slim modern form. So I've got a scan of the taillights. I got to recreate the reflectors and then I might bring those back into the world. That's kind of one of the projects on my list. So that would be nice because I know that we don't have access to back left taillights anymore. And if I can do those and modify them to fit like the sequential boards that I have that Toby and the Drayron people made, then we can kind of have a perfect fit housing uh, and just get it printed in ABS. And then the reflectors are just kind of, you can print in clear resin and then tint them. And the resin withstands negative uh, 50 degrees Fahrenheit and 190 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's stronger than plastic. And if we use a tough resin, it'll go down to negative uh, 70 and 190. So you can actually, or no, I'm sorry, 280 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can actually make working engine block parts out of it. Um, so there's a bunch of fun things we can do, but uh, right now I've been kind of recreating things that don't exist anymore or are no longer available so that you know people can recreate parts that we can't get, so. That's awesome. Is, is there a, can you post the link to where you've shared those or is it just kind of contact you and, and get what no, you need? It's, I've shared it on DeLorean owners, DeLorean technical help and DeLorean restoration. I have a global Dropbox that has all the files, but I'll actually post the link in this chat too. And so what I do is I give the files away because I know most people don't have 3D printers now, but in about five years, it's going to be a lot easier for people to get access to that. And there's a company called Shapeways that'll print for you. They're going to charge you a markup, but as the technology gets cheaper, the uh, the good thing is the files exist. So I just pasted in the chat, the Dropbox link. So I've done things like recreated the defrost logos. I've created an ashtray insert. So if you wanted to replace your ashtray with anything you wanted, you can kind of do it. I have a dashboard extension piece, a whole bunch of crazy stuff. I've recreated the snap steering bushing as a temporary solution. So while you're waiting for Toby's bushings to come in, 
um, you can actually snap a half disc in to get you through the next week or two. Um, you don't have to take the steering assembly out to do it. It's like a temporary Band-Aid piece and a bunch of other random things. I've also recreated the HVAC panel that I, you know, it's, I'm redesigning it right now specifically for David McKean's, uh, you know, lighted LED board, but I've recreated the original. So if you need to have a new HVAC panel to put a sticker over, you can 3D print that part and just, you know, place it right in the car. Cause I know that one's no longer available as well. Um, on the That's topic, so awesome. sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, uh, created a 3D file of the um, steering wheel adapter that DMC Houston used to sell that hasn't been available for a while. Uh, I've not, I don't have the ability to print out of steel, but somebody who does could probably take that and make new steering adapters. Yeah, how big is it roughly inch wise? Um, I don't know, four inches across diameter, five. So it probably, it probably cost you, and it's about yay thick, like two inches thick, something like that. Well, I mean, it, it's it's hollow, so it, it's like uh, oh. it was originally cast. So you can probably get it printed in steel um, in any color, black, silver, gold, whatever, for probably about, if you did it through Shaveways, it probably cost you about 90 bucks, 90 to 120 bucks to get it printed in steel. There's about a three-week delay. They charge about a 1,000% markup on their cost. It probably only yeah. costs them $5, but if you needed it, you could take your file and just make a steel one. I mean, like yeah. the steel right here. Well, well I have one. I was just the, mentioning it oh, yeah. for other people. Uh, the file is yeah. on my website, nerdvana.net. I'll post it in the chat here. I think I would love that adapter. Everyone has been asking about them. Now, folks, keep in mind that for next year's virtual DeLorean weekend, we will need a whole nother group of uh, victims, I mean, volunteers, to uh, put together talks. And Brandon, I'd love to see one on all of your fun stuff uh, as part of DeLorean Weekend 2021 virtually. Would that be all right? Sure. By that time, I may have made another 20 parts for this car. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty fantastic. So everybody keep in mind that we are going to need another, another crew next year to help us make this such a, an amazing event as we, we have already this year. My new, my new thing that I'm waiting on for Toby is once I get his, uh, I just ordered his remote system and I'm going to reverse engineer it into a key fob that I can slide the car key into so that I can actually contain the entire, you know, so here's my DMC key. I can contain the entire, um, the entire thing in there and just, just wire in switches uh, to essentially match the pattern of his remote so I can have a remote keyless system as well as uh, be able to pull my key out to use in the car and keep it all contained in one spot because I don't know about you guys, but these key, these keys keep sawing holes in my jeans. So I needed something to, <laughs> I was bored and I needed something to build. So here's the, that's what this steel one is. The steel one is actually, this is my prototype in resin. And this is the one in uh, stainless steel, steel here, steel here, anodized. And it's, you know, it's, it's pretty good. And then it's got a pretty good grip on it. So anyway. I'm going to keep making weird things. So Toby, that's why I bought the remote because I'm going to reverse engineer it into a uh, key fob. When I was doing the video for DeLorean weekend and one thing I noticed after I was done with the video, my antenna was still up when the car was off. <laughs> so, and oh, wow. Yeah. Well, guess what? The little nylon cable. Well, you know, mm -hmm. after 40 years, it, just finally just got brittle enough where it went snap. So, but at least it's in the up position. <laughs> so yeah, that's good. The only I wonder if that's one that, that I, I can't fully cover my car with the car cover. So either I have to punch is a the, hole in the car cover. <laughs> is the, is the, is the cable just a cable or is it an electrical cable? No, What's it's the part it's that broke. The actual, the actuator cable that raises and lowers the antenna. And what oh, usually okay. happens is on the spool there, you know, it's, it gets kinked and usually tied off. And just by, you know, the process up and down, up and down just over time. And of course, plastic does get brittle over time. It normally will break at that spot. And so I just, I just last Monday, they just, um, I called up uh, Danny. He had had one new old stock with the newer components in it. And so I got the, I got a new antenna. And so all I got to do now is just you know, spend a couple of hours with D and uh, put the new one in. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, 
I'm like fine. I'm like science project wise. I think I'm going to finally tackle rebuilding the taillight. I, I, I've got it specked out. I've got the whole frame digitally rebuilt already. And I think I'm going to take the reflectors and reverse engineer them. It won't be department of transportation certified. It'll be the right. off-road use only thing, but I think I can get it as close to a one-to-one -one match that you wouldn't tell, um, which might be nice for people that are missing taillights. I don't think I'll be able to like put the DMC branding on the, on the reflector part, but you know, maybe I can build it a piecemeal system where it's got snap in reflectors. So if you ever crack a reflector, I'll build it to the same specifications. Mm -hmm. and you might be able to put it on original new taillights, or original old stock taillights. So, you know, maybe people don't have to replace the whole housing, they can just replace the reflectors as they age. Very so the good. people that have like, so we'll see. That one's my white whale. I'm chasing it over the next, uh, few weeks so we'll see what comes of it <laughs> brandon the, re the reflectors are actually snap in in the original lights did you know that i did not know that chris was actually going to send me a damaged taillight so i could take a look at it because yeah, i yeah. Uh, it, yeah. i just need to basically get the pattern that's the problem and because it's translucent i can't really scan it so i'm gonna have to hand recreate the pattern the same way to the keys um the scanning technology doesn't actually work with translucency. I can baby powder it, but the shape is not the same. Yeah, the the uh, reflector it's held in by a couple of little teeth, little serrations that uh, that that it pops into and, and engages. And so you can get the reflector out of there. You just have to be very careful because the reflectors are quite brittle, and so the the right. tab break off. But uh, but yeah, you can you can take a, a a very small flat bladed pick of some sort and. And uh, and pop the reflector out, and that way you can just recreate the reflector alone if you'd like, and then and then have it um, be able to fit into your whatever your reproduction housings are going to be eventually, or uh, use it as a replacement well, for the originals. That might be a conversation you and I can get into because I think um, and you go in from the back with a flathead to get the reflector out, obviously not the front. Yeah, because maybe what I can do. Okay. Because what I can do is I can probably actually recreate the reflectors first instead of the frame. Um, because I feel like a lot of people might want to replace their reflectors, especially the amber ones, and figure out what the tooling would be to get, uh, you know, to figure out what the mold would be to get an actual run made on all the amber pieces and probably a stronger plastic that has a little bit more color retention properties. Something that's like got a UV treating in the plastic, and that might actually be a way to replace those amber taillight pieces with something new and still maintain kind of the Department of Transportation certification on them, because we yeah. can do it out of, maybe even out of like Delrin or something, depending on the translucency. Well, one uh, one thought that I had on the reflectors, getting back to that is uh, they, they are replaceable. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of people over the years, before the LEDs kind of took hold and all that stuff, <laughs> they, um, uh, in order to get more light out the back, uh, people would just put in larger light bulbs in that center running light position. Uh, I right. did that. I did that and melted both of my reflectors. So, so look in my light housings, both reflectors are all bubbled up and nasty looking. And <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's interesting because the new, the new 3D resin that I put in the chat can withstand really, really high temperatures now, more yeah. so than the plastic would. But the problem is just the, the cost to it's the cost to everything else, like that steering bushing that uh, one of the gentlemen on here had done. I just did a price markup on printing it in steel, and it's about $1,000 to print the part in steel, so it's cheaper to just CNC mill it. Yeah. So, um, but for the reflectors, yeah, I mean, I feel like if I can, the first thing for me is just coming up with a file that's validated that will snap into the original housing and look the same visually in clear resin. And if I can recreate that, then I can, you know, maybe you and I can have a talk and see if we can do a DeLorean Northwest thing where you can maybe provide that for people. Though I don't know, do people want to replace single reflectors or would they want the entire housing? Like, what's the most common thing that you've seen? Uh, well, the, the most common thing, obviously, is the boards because <laughs> the, uh, the taillight right. boards, you know, and, and people wanting to convert to LEDs and all that. But uh, but there are a lot of there are a lot of the the reflectors that are melted like mine are because people have tried. <clears throat> um, okay. And then there's you know the the fact that they're no longer available housings themselves too, 
you know, whenever right. something pining for it. Okay, guys, can I interject just a moment here? Uh, we've gotten a request from Chris Miles to move everybody into a break room. And I know we're also coming upon the hour when Jordan Livingston's Q&A is going to happen with Bob Gale and Jeffrey Wiseman and Ken uh, and various other folks. So Chris, are, if you're there, can you unmute and share your plans with us? I was just saying, if, if we had one breakout room, then people could go to that if they wanted to talk more privately. And okay. if, if everyone's on that room, then anyone could go back and forth at their pleasure. Okay, well, what I can do is I can throw everybody into a breakout room right now. Then if you want to come back here, you'll still have the ability to go into that breakout room. Right. right. Okay, so let me just make one breakout room here. And then okay. I will open that room. And uh, Jordan, how are you doing? Okay. So great. So that uh, concludes this portion of our program.